Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode number 28. Um, I'm Jackie Jones and I'm the co-host with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook on the therapy show Behind Closed Doors. And following on from last week's about boundaries, we're going to be looking at the use of the self in the therapy room and self-disclosure. How much do we disclose and how much do we not? Another wonderful topic. (laughs) It is. It's right up my uh, alley, this, because... uh, But let's start at what we mean by therapy, what we mean by counselling, and which disciplines we've been trained in. So, for example, if you were trained psychodynamically, which basically means, I mean, the psychodynamic therapist listening, this is a very basic definition, so don't ring in, but basically (laughs) means how the past is reenacted in the present. That's why it's called psychodynamic, because of the psychological dynamics of this, how the past is uh, played out, or enacted is the word, in the present. Now, um, if you're trained in that particular school, then you will have whole training on how to use self-disclosure, and there'll be a frame of reference for understanding that. If you're trained in the person-centred mode of therapy or stroke counselling, it's a completely different type of therapy where self-disclosure isn't order of the day. So I think it depends what training school, if you're trained in a CBT, it's a completely different way of thinking as well. If you're trained in transaction analysis, now it burns it very much a psychodynamic model. And the way that I... I was trained by Richard Erskine. I was trained by the early TA therapists who thought psychodynamically and it was saw TA as a very developmental model. So then I will naturally have a whole frame of reference about using the self and disclosure of the self in the therapeutic relationship. Whereas I think other students from other models might have a different frame. Yes. I just wanted to say that because I don't want to come from a position of you know, this, 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 what we're going to talk about is the only way of doing therapy. But in this psychodynamic and transactional way of training, it, it, it's often seen as a really important way to do therapy. Yeah. I, I did a year of person centered counseling, well, and that was part of the the process that I didn't like that I was kind of supposed to leave part of me outside the therapy room door and I didn't necessarily like that no because why didn't you well if it's relevant to the session and relevant to the client you know and I can be empathic with them because I've been through something similar or show an understanding of that in the room I see that as quite a positive experience Mm. obviously not taking over the session and talking about myself for 50 minutes but if it's relevant I think I should be in the room completely as opposed to leaving part of me outside. I suppose the question would be, uh, what is relevant? So, so for example, in your frame of reference of what you're thinking as a therapist, you're making a decision all the time. What is relevant and what isn't relevant in the context of how you see therapeutic cure? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's an important one because... Some other therapists from different disciplines uh, may see things in a very different ways. So with that last bit you added on, which I thought was crucial, very crucial, and you said it sort of as a, um, I don't know if it's just, you smiled when you said, of course, that's not where I talk forever and take over the session. But if you go to some polarities, certainly in person-centered, um, it's the fact of by actually talking at all maybe is 
taking the space away from the client to speak. Mm, yeah. So I think it depends what you're trained and what your thought process is around. And I th using the self in psychotherapy, and I, 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 I'll clearly say where I come from in this. And I come from a psychodynamic view, uh, and that is the past is often enacted out in the present. So clients coming to therapy will enact out with me often the traumas, confusion, difficulties um, they've had in relationships. And by using um, myself, I can provide a different type of uh, object, if you like, um, so the person can get a different type of experience. Yeah. What a wonderful way of putting it. Mm. Yeah. When you were saying that then, because I know you said about a frame of reference and everything, I think that that's one of the things that I found a bit confusing about all of it, is if I'm not fully in the room, then how can I have my frame of reference? But uh, And, well, I'll be a devil's, devil's advocate, or I'll have a response. As always, go for it, Bob. <laughs> no, I'll have a response to that. And that is, is your frame of reference useful in any frame in any way you look at it to affect cure now some people might say well that's your frame of reference by bringing your frame of reference in you're providing contamination and you're actually the person who's selecting and taking away from the space of the client's empowerment so it it, it depends i think on what you see cure is how to how to the best way to elicit cure and it usually goes back to where you were trained yeah yeah i i i don't i i i kind of relate it to being authentically me and you know hand on heart i i can only it, see things okay. through my own frame of reference of course and it's you it's and fake it, if it's anything else. Yeah, well, that's one way to look at it. I think you have to go back to ask yourself, right, really, what, what role or what do you see yourself as doing as the inverted commas psychotherapist in the room? Now, if it is to be real, authentic, uh, less, uh, more transparent, uh, being uh, what's the word you use less fake or whatever the words were used then how does that affect cure for the person opposite you now i'm sure you can respond back to that and i think a bigger question is that's the way you may see it but is it the way the client sees this so when the client walks in the room from beginning to the end they're living in the world of projections uh, and, and if anybody listening, projection is what you put onto the other person. Yeah. Right. So I'm here, Jack is there, we're the therapist, the client comes in, from the moment they open the door, they are going to project onto me or project onto Jackie in this sense, their own frame, their own history, their own experiences and what and how they expect you to act or not act. And according to their history, they'll slot you into that. Yeah. Now, by being the most genuine person in the world, the most friendly person in the world, I'm talking about the therapist here. Yeah. For somebody who's had a very harmful dysfunctional history, that actually could be more harmful than good. Mm. In other words, they might actually see that mm. as all a big trick yeah. to uh, seduce you so that you can XXXX. So I think it's about what, the therapist sees as the methods to affect cure. So by being yourself in the room, that's fine at one level, but what does it mean for the therapist is another question. Sorry, what does it mean for the client? The client yeah. Another question altogether. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you go back to Freud, now this is a long time ago, over a century ago now, uh, his view of psychoanalysis way before the world of psychodynamic and therapy and everything else was that the the 
the, the, the therapist shouldn't bring their self into the equation at all. That in fact, if you went and looked at psychotherapy, psychoanalytical books before 1940, yeah, nearly all the books would be about the therapist staying out of the relationship and not using their sense of self at all. Why? Because the therapist needs to be out of the equation so they're not contaminating the field. They're allowing the client to have the uh, space to inter to just free associate, just talk about anything they want. And out of that conversation will come the material of healing that is needed. And the therapist needs to keep out of the picture. Now, we're now in a place in 2000, you know, now 21, where it's very different in many ways from the early psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. And we've evolved to what is often called self-psychology. And you go to the bookshops or Amazon or whatever you've got online now. And the majority of the third books, third books might be the complete opposite, which is about how you actually bring yourself into the relationship in the service of cure. So we've had a complete revolution in how we see healing. And probably I would say 1990-ish, uh, called, often called the relational turn in psychotherapy, where many, many books started to write about using the self in the relationship in the effect of cure was the most effective way forward. Yeah. So we've had a revolution in the idea of using the self in the therapeutic relationship from Freud to where we are today. I quite like the revolution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see yeah, it as co-creation in, in that, do you know what I mean? It's, it's co-creating a relationship. I, I, I see w w my interactions with other people, whether that's in the therapy room or outside of the therapy room, it's 50% me and 50% them, that adult to adult, we are... Though, Jackie, should it be? Co-creating. The question is, should it be? In the therapy room or outside of the in therapy, the therapy room. room? Should it be? I think so. Well, here's another way of looking at this. If you saw therapy around empowerment, helping a client develop self-agency, helping the client develop self-confidence, helping the client assert themselves. If you are taking 50% of the conversation, how does that help? No, I, I didn't say 50% of the conversation. What did you mean then when you said that? That I think we co-create the therapeutic relationship together. It's it's, See, I'm with you, but I'm saying there is another view. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. I think yeah. you do co-create a relationship. I agree with you. And I think that through the co-created relationship, we can start providing a type of healing uh, which gives a new experiences to the clients which come from quite a dysfunctional relationship. So that is my style of therapy. And there is other views on this. Yeah. And I think another view on this is keep out of the relationship. Yeah. Now, I hear you said, and I thought that was great what you said, where you prefer the co-created one, and I do as well, but I think it's important to look at the heritage of where we've come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think you touched on it earlier on. I see that more as the psychoanalytic bit that I... I feel uncomfortable with that because it's kind of like they're in charge and they've got all the answers and the client. Yeah, that was Freud's first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I already you know understand. that lying on the couch and yeah, psychoanalysis. away and I'll analyze you. Yeah. Psychoanalysis. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I like about that. Study of the unconscious. And the idea that it isn't just a co-created relationship. It's also two unconscious forces coming together. Ooh, interesting. So it's a different type of relationship. Yeah. Because when people talk about relationships in psychotherapy, I think, well, what relationships are we talking about? 
No, we could be talking about the relationships of probably to our age now, or we could talk about the relationships um, from outside the therapy room, or we could talk the coming together of two unconscious processes. Mm. Now, so psychoanalysis was all about the interpretation and the analysis of the unconscious. But where I agree with you completely, which is, and I don't, I don't agree with this either, it was from an expert one up, one down position. Well, I'm much, much more a believer in terms of healing and effective cure is a, to look at the therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the client as a co-creative relationship and out of that, getting new more, getting more new healing uh, experiences, which the client can actually um, grow from. Yeah. So I'm more on your side of the fence. Um, the, one of the problems I have though about this is if the therapist coming from that frame of reference has, it also unconsciously might be coming from an ego driven place, what you might want to call narcissism, yeah. unresolved narcissism. So in the co-creative relationship it's led by them rather than created co in a co-created way yeah i i i'd like to think uh, early on in the therapeutic relationship i'm you know looking for and being aware of changes in dynamic on whatever the conversation is whether there's a shift in, in ego states or whether there's a shift in them what the conversation was about at that time whether it's making them feel vulnerable or blame or shame all those sort of things it, it's on a different level if that makes sense yeah and because I... sometimes you know clients might not want me to take up any time in the session which is absolutely okay yeah, it's absolutely okay. And what I, what I did like was that you were you were talking about. I think you were talking about how you are thinking clinically about, and I think it's really important this that you're thinking clinically about what's happening in the relationship, what you may bring into the relationship, and what's going on in the relationship in the service of cure. Yes. Yeah. Now that's very important because otherwise. People that give license for therapists to just talk about anything. Yeah. Now, so for example, I think if a person, if a therapist is going to disclose aspects of themselves or their own histories or bring their sense of self into the work, or for whatever reasons, they need to do it from a clinical frame in the service of the client. Yeah. That's a big, big uh, belief of mine. Yeah, because I, I've had clients in the past that are really good at avoiding certain subjects by asking questions about how's my week been and how's, how am I doing and how, and it's kind of like a really good way of let's divert off the topic of conversation because I'm feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> And I will point that out to them. Mm. And you could also, another clinical way of doing this, you might think you want to go along with it. Yes. So, you might, so I think it's about the therapist through the contract, the understanding how a person enacts out their history in the relationship with the therapist I think means that the therapist can think clinically about what they do next. Mm. Yeah. So, for example, let me take that example of what you just said. So somebody starts to manipulate you or distract you or displace you because they don't want to talk about, um, you know, their depression or they don't want to talk about 
their denial or they don't want to talk about their trauma or they don't want so you think clinically and i don't know if you would or you wouldn't but it's a, i understand many people would and i might as well would be well i think i'm going to bring that into the person's awareness the, the, there's a distraction or displacement or moving away from what we need to talk about so i'll do that now that's a very positive clinical thinking for many ways i'm thinking about how you do it important though yes yeah because you may do it in a way which might elicit a different level of trauma altogether a much deeper level to do with shame to do with early traumas yeah so i think as long as it's thought out clinically how you use yourself the sense of self in the service of the client i think we're on to a winner yeah and that comes with time and building a relationship with the client i can think of one particular absolutely. instance absolutely where a client i don't want to break any confidentiality or anything but a client i was feeling the urge to comfort a client and i knew from you know the history that we had together that the client found it very difficult to ask for her needs to be met and i can remember in that moment thinking do i offer comfort or is that buying into the scripty stuff of not being able to ask for the needs to be met? And I can remember in my head being in a bit of a, a, a turmoil as to what to do with that. Yeah, but that's good what you're talking about. But that's that's the kind of situation that I see as for the cure of the, the client. Rather than just jumping in and doing it, there's kind of something else going on for me. Am I reinforcing? the script by jumping in when really I would like to encourage them to ask for their needs to be met. Yeah, so that's great in my book because it means you're thinking about how you would use your sense of self yeah. in the service of the client. Yeah. So on the same page then by the sounds of it. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> Let's turn this conversation to something uh, very, very important. I don't think we can do a podcast on talking about how we'd use our sense of self or not, the therapeutic relationship, if we did not talk about the concept of transference. Yeah. Do you agree with me or? Yes, not? 100%. So how do you see transference then? Um, transference is the therapist reaction or response to something counter transference but transference itself how do you see it well i go on tell me how do i okay, see so it? How I, I, see I do it from my frame of reference how i see transference is created relationship there's two parts of transference there's what will be called transference through projection of the um what the client will transfer onto the therapist. Yeah. In other words, uh, when you frown like that, you remind me of when I was three talking to my father. Yeah. So they project the father onto you. And then there's the response to the tran transfer. So my counter transfer to that might be, uh, well, I'm really angry. I'm not your father and I'm not going to act like your father. And you remind me of a needy XX. So the therapist response is the counter transference and that both makes up the transfer both those parts make up the transferential encounter yeah and why that is important is if you can analyze step into or use the transference you can play out in a different way what happened or never happened in a person's history so you can allow them to experience a set of experiences in a different way and write their own script in a different way to get a different outcome today. Yeah. Is, is that dependent on them verbalising and letting you know what's going on? Or is that a case of when I was talking earlier on about looking for a shift, something's 
the dynamics have changed somehow? Well, I don't think the clients need in any form, shape, or unless they want to have some educative therapy, need to talk about transference or what's happening in a in the way that we're talking about it now, because I'm talking about it for the podcast listeners. But the clients don't need to know any of that stuff. But I think for the therapist, they need to think about who am I for the client and who is the client for them? So in other words, they need to think about when they're in a relationship with the person in front of them, who they are for that client. And I think also to think about who the client is for them. By understanding those unconscious transferential processes, they will then start to think about, well, when will or might I step into the, or use myself in the uh, therapeutic relationship for affecting different experiences? But unless they start thinking about who am I for the client, or who the client is for me, they're now starting to think unconsciously, are they? They're starting to think about, or they might just start to think about things in the here and now rather than what's being played out in the here and now. Yeah. If that yeah. makes sense. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so the end whole, bit, I got that, yeah. yeah. So the whole of psychodynamic theory is built on what I've just said to you. Yeah. In other words, the past is reenacted in the present. So to understand that, if the therapist thinks about who am I for the client, they're halfway there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Because another way of thinking of that, that is this is, I'm never Bob Cook. I'm simply a representation of the client's projection from the past. Wow, that's a bit heavy. But yeah. I'm never, I'm never Jackie Jones. Yeah. I'm simply a representation of somebody or, or, or quality from the person's past. Yeah. Now, if their past was particularly a disturbed one, then they're going to project onto you um, and enact out with you those experiences which were perhaps quite negative from the past and they're going to attempt even from an unconscious place to manipulate you to be that person yeah now this is where using yourself might come in from a psychodynamic way because if you start thinking that way you've got several choices you can allow yourself to be manipulated from an adult place yeah. to actually get a relationship in a different manner so that you can allow the person to go to a healing place and um, get a different types of experiences or you can actually do something very different which is confront the transference to say well i'm not your father or you could do many other things but you are actually thinking about how you might use your sense of self to allow the person to have a different experience in the past from what they're attempting to enact out with you yeah because if you allow them to just enact out their past experiences onto the relationship with you you're allowing them to repeat history yeah or in ta terms you're actually unconsciously supporting them um, carrying out their familiar script and games with the same script outcome. Yeah. It's just reinforcing it. Yeah. So for somebody who's been sexually abused, a therapist, the worst thing a therapist can say is, can I give you, or maybe the worst thing a therapist yeah. say, is without awareness, certainly will be the worst thing a therapist say, can I give you a hug? Because mm. for you, the age you are at 71 or sorry you're even much younger uh you're <laughs> doing it from that adult position for them they they can we they can enact out their past project onto the therapist and suddenly you're that negative object or abuser yeah so if you don't understand the unconsciousness you, you you'll you'll have a different type of therapy 
Yeah. And it will, and also from this frame of reference, it would the therapist then uh, starts thinking clinically about how they may use their sense of self, so that the client has a different set of experiences from what they are attempting to enact out in the present with you. Yeah. Is this too? Um, am I losing you? No, 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 not at all. This. I thought if I'm losing you, I'm losing. Yeah, no, losing no, no. It makes perfect sense. It, it is, you know, that, that bringing the past into the present and replaying it through transference and my reaction as the therapist to that, or my response to it in the therapy room. Yeah, it, exactly like you say, it can either re-traumatized to a certain extent or it can show them a different outcome from it oh, oh. that example if I, if I just went in for a hug <laughs> that would not be the best in that situation I thought. yeah I yeah. think it's a very good practice for therapists automatically if they think oh well I want to hug the client for some reason yeah yeah. that they say is it okay if I hug you yeah now I think a therapist automatically should say that and they could still go wrong yes yeah so you know we should have another again part. it's that frame of reference isn't it it's how it's yeah. seen by the other person yeah we should have another podcast perhaps we have on our list on the use of touch in psychotherapy yes yeah because mostly we're talking about transferential trust, transferential touch. So therapists that might see, well, at 10 past nine on 2021 in March, or whatever the date was, I, I, you know, I thought it was important to an end in a way of a positive regard or whatever to give the client a hug. Well, that's it. That's take. It isn't taking into account. What could be happening transferentially? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I've. Yeah, I, I don't even sit on the couch with my clients. I'm on a chair, and they're usually on the couch. So, in order for me to have any physical contact with them, I would have to get up and move towards them, or them to me, if if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting podcast we should do. It is, it is, because even as I'm thinking about it now, when we were talking about boundaries and maybe barriers, not only have I when I was seeing clients face to face, I'm in a chair and they're on a couch, but I've also got a, a, a low table in between us, which could be seen as a, a barrier. barrier. You know, literally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it could be recreating history for someone. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. What I want to say in this podcast, which is really important, I don't want to de-skill people. I want people to think about things from a deeper level and what's happening mm -hmm. going, or even considering what might be happening in an unconscious place. Because I believe clients, not from an adult place, but from a, a, a different younger place, will be always attempting to manipulate the therapist to create history for them. Mm. Yeah. Because e even as you're saying that, ultimately, if, if, if we do something different that goes against the scripty stuff, that itself, yes, it, you know, can be a forerunner to cure, but it also causes a lot of turmoil for the client. It can do, and there's a term in transactional analysis psychotherapy I really like, and it's from a book in 1969, so it's a long time ago. What you say after you say hello by Eric Byrne, mm. who was the originator of transactional analysis therapy, and he coined this term, script backlash. Yes, that, that was what I was going to say. It's like, well, what's the point? <laughs> I've, I've lived my life by this for so long, and now you're just shattering it. And or, or yeah, happened. yeah. yeah. And I think therapists really need to think about the backlash which will inevitably come when a person attempts to make life changes. Yes. Yeah. 
that is something I talk quite regular about with clients, mm. Mm. particularly in the early early that's, days. That's another podcast. Yes. We've got so many. We have. The list is getting longer and longer, Bob. So I, I just, I've really enjoyed this one and the one that we did before as well. They, they've been really interesting. I learned something new every time we have these discussions. So what we're going to be looking at next time is... Who do you is, think you are for me, Jackie? Say, who do I think... In a transferential language... Who do you think you might be for me? Or even, you know, I can answer that for you, Arthur. You know, you could be, for example, uh, uh, a elder sister that I didn't have. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's what I encourage. I'd like to really encourage the podcast listeners to think about it in those terms and to think about, well, who could Jackie be for me? And I've got to say, oh, who could I be for Jackie? And it, no. Why it's important is that you're starting to think about what could be enacted out and yeah. how the client may attempt to manipulate you into actually continuing the way they're thinking, taking a script payoff and nothing changes. Yeah. So it's just allowing the other person to think at a deeper level. Yeah. And that that just says it all because it, it is at a deeper level. It's when you talk about manipulation and things like that, it's not that it's a conscious thing a lot no, of the no, time. No. It's a completely, you know, out of awareness that we all do it to replay our script. All the time. Yeah. Yeah, they talk about games, ulterior yeah. transactions, repetitive behaviors, scripts as life plans. It's all really to keep the decisions the person made about themselves, others, and the world going. Yeah. Now, that's fine. If it's healthy, we'll never see those people. No, no. But the people that come through the door that have anxiousness, stress, depression, trauma, or we could go on and on, and are having an unhappy life, they're playing out scripts, decisions, which are unhealthy. And how the therapist helps the person move those unconscious processes is what therapy is about, in my frame of reference. This is why I love transactional analysis, Bob. I I love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So thank you for allowing me to talk. I feel I've started to talk about my passion and hobby horse in this podcast. And it Maybe. comes across in a very positive <laughs> way. Maybe there's a transferential part of that, but anyway. We, we, we can discuss that. So we will be back next time with another exciting episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors. Uh, we're we're going to be looking about um, effective communication and relationships. Yeah, coming near Christmas. Yes, yeah. We might all, need, well, no, that's me presuming things, yeah. Um, a lot of us uh, might need some support yeah, around that. That Christmas, <laughs> all the reconstructed families come together, the pressure... Uh, we all feel to uh, have a jolly good time and everything. And yeah. quite often um, we see that, well, this is very, very true for me anyway, in my long experience of being a therapist, that in the first week or second week of January, uh, I hear all the uh, traumatic reenactments of many Christmases being played out. Yes, I often talk about my mum in that respect, bless her heart. Yes. She always says, I don't look forward to Christmas. And I'm like, why not? It's something bad always happens at Christmas. And I once asked her, how many bad Christmases have you had? And yeah, yeah. She's 80. And she said, well, I can remember this one. And I'm like, you had one bad Christmas. Yeah. And in her head, something bad always happens at Christmas. But alongside that, coming into December and Christmas and everything, I think last year and the pandemic have had an impact on how we connect with with people yeah, and you know last year wasn't a good christmas for a lot of people and is that going to impact on them this year well it's a podcast i look forward to talking about good good right so i shall see you next time bob thank you so much take care you bye too bye, bye. bye. you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week 
with another episode.